and career. He was the sort of leader that Israel had in mind when they asked for a king. You remember last week when we looked at what started this whole uh, train of kingship and the monarchy in Israel. Well, it was the people came to Samuel and asked for a king. And they, we, we looked at last week and noticed that they asked for one in the wrong way. But nonetheless, they asked for a king. And to this point, and that is the point that we are arriving at in chapter 12, and we're arriving, and we are coming midstream of the chapter, so I need to say a few things to orient us before we read. Uh, Saul has met their expectations. The expectations were that this king would go and would fight on behalf of the people and essentially do what everything that the Lord had done for his people for 400 years. So they had the, expect, the expectations on their king uh, that Israel had had previously on God. So here was a man who had to try to perform in the way that God had. Now, one thing that was implicit that we need to keep in mind as we look at Saul's life, because we're going to take his life as a whole tonight. We're going to learn from his whole life, and so we're going to speak to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 12 through 1 Samuel chapter 31. So really the whole part of the book which deals with Saul's life. But there's something important to remember as we begin to read about his life, and that is that the people chose Saul to replace Samuel. Now, if you've ever been replaced, how did you feel towards the person who replaced you? Okay, so that dynamic is going to become a factor as we look at Saul's life. So, we're going to pick up here in the middle of chapter 12 of verse Samuel, in verse 12 through 24, and this is Samuel's address to the nation. Saul has just won a valiant victory and he's about to address, and he's in the middle of addressing the nation, actually, after Saul has rescued the people of Jabesh-Gilead, which is over in present-day Jordan. So the nation is celebrating. Saul is celebrating. They're renewing the kingdom. But the Scripture is very clear that Samuel is not celebrating. He's conducting his ministry, but he's not happy about it. And so this young, the point of me saying all that, is that we have to know as we look at Saul's life and as we enter into 1 Samuel 12, and this is the most important thing, this young, talented, skilled king is now caught between the man he replaced and the people he now serves. He's caught between Samuel and the people of Israel, and that's going to affect the rest of his life, and that's going to affect how we look and learn from his life. And so, with all that said, let's hear together this part of the Lord's Word as we read from 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verses 12 to 24. This is Samuel speaking to Saul and to the people of Israel. When you saw that Nahash the king of the Ammonites came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us, when the Lord your God was your king. Now behold, the king whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked, behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and then if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Now therefore, stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I'll call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord. The Lord set thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die, for we've added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. Samuel said to the people, Do not be afraid. You have done all this evil. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people 
for his great namesake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it for me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord, serve him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pause to thank you again for every part of your word. We know that it takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. That we must sit under the entire counsel of the Lord if we are to know the full will of the Lord, the full revelation of God. And so, Father, we thank you for this part of your word. We thank you for this history that you have inspired. And you have given it to us for our learning. And so I pray that your Holy Spirit who inspired these words would come tonight and would minister to us in a special way the lesson that you would have us learn from this first king of Israel. And so, Father, would you make the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts tonight to be pleasing and honoring in your sight. O oh, Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when I was a senior in high school, it's getting to be a few years now, actually. Um, when I was a senior in high school, there was a young man that I uh, grew up with uh, who was tragically killed in a car accident um, in March of 2005. He, he was in a coma for four days. He was leaving a friend's house, and he had been drinking, though we don't know whether or not he was under the influence when he was driving. We do know that he was drinking. And he hit a tree, and he wasn't going very fast, but he hit a tree in just the right way that he was in a coma for four days. And I remember having known this young man my whole life, and it was, it was as though the, the minutes were hours, and the hours were weeks, and the days that passed seemed like months when we were waiting to see whether or not he would, he would survive. But four days later, he passed. And I remember being 17 years old and coming face to face with death in that way. And I'll never forget his graveside service. Uh, he was 17 and, and he, I mean, it was a rainy March afternoon and there were friends and there were family, most of whom I don't think knew the Lord. And for that reason, it was hysteria. I have never been to a funeral like that since. It was sheer hysteria. Here's a 17-year-old boy who's gone, and just the, the utter tragedy of the whole thing uh, was stunning, really, as I look back on it now some 15 years later. But I look back on that, and I see the same thing as when I look at the life of King Saul. I see a tragedy. I see a tragic life. Now, as we're looking at the life of King Saul, one thing we have to recognize is that it didn't start out tragic, but it certainly ended that way. As I said when we read the scripture, here's a young, courageous, gifted, seemingly devout man who ends up having a tragic death and end to his career. Um, in the latter, he had about a 10-year reign. In the latter years of it, we know that he suffered from severe depression that he was overcome by intense jealousy for the man who would eventually become his successor. Uh, he lost his faith. I mean, at the, ba at the battle, um, at the preceding the battle where he would lose his life, he consults a witch and he deals with the dead. So he's lost his faith. Um, and he died an embarrassing death. King Saul was actually, the, he was dismembered and the parts of his body were sent out to different parts of the land and it was an embarrassing death but the point of all that is we have to deal with this fact that Saul's story is in the Bible 
And God wants us to learn something from it. God wants us to learn something from this tragedy of Saul's life. And so the way we do that is I think we have to ask ourselves this question. How could Saul's life not have been a tragedy? What would have had to have happened? What would Saul have needed for his life not to have taken this, this tragic trajectory that it could? What would, what would this friend of mine have needed as he was a 16, 17-year-old boy? What did he need for the end of his life not to be tragic? And the answer is actually very simple, and this is what we're going to concentrate on tonight, and that is devout friends. That's what King Saul did not have. And as I look back on this friend's life, he didn't have devout friends. He had all sorts of acquaintances and friends, but he didn't have devout friends. And by devout, I mean friends that are first and foremost devoted to God and then devoted to their friend. And I think that's the lesson that we take from the life of King Saul is that God might very well have us to intervene in someone's life. And I guess the point of what I'm trying to say is that God is teaching us through Saul's life that somebody out there needs you to be the kind of friend that Saul did not have. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at three episodes from Saul's life. And we're going to ask ourselves the question, what would a devout friend have done in each of these episodes? And what we're going to do is we're going to take those lessons from each episode and then, Lord willing, we're going to go and be that devout friend for somebody uh, so that you don't have to attend a funeral like I did where a, where a young person's life or an old person's life ends tragically because nobody, no Christian, intervened. And so that's how we want to take Saul's life in. And so as we look big picture here, um, here's how I think, as we look at these three episodes, here's what I think a devout friend looks like. And what if, if a devout friend had done these things to Saul, here's how I think things might have gone differently. So the first thing a devout friend could have done for Saul was minister the Word of God to him in the specific situation that he's in. And we're going to look at an episode in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel to see that. To minister the Word of God in the specific situation that Saul was in. Then we're going to flip over to chapter 15 and take one scene, uh, verses 1 to 34. We're going to look at it as a whole and say, if a, if a devout friend had come to Saul and given him wise counsel. So Saul had to make a very very calculated decision and he made a bad decision but if he had had a devout friend that would come in and that would say Saul let me give you some wise and helpful counsel then then his life may not have taken the course that it did and then finally and we won't say as much about this but chapter 16 to 31 deal with Saul's jealousy over David and that ends up dominating his life and what he had to have was a friend to come in and say and deal with the deepest issues of Saul's heart. He needed a friend to deal with him on that level and he didn't have it. So that's, that's what we want to do. That's what we want, how we want to take in Saul's life here. Okay, so first, seeing that had Saul had a devout friend to minister the word to him, his life might not have taken the trajectory that it did. So let's look at this first episode. So we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 13. We're going to take this really in sum. And so I'm going to summarize for you the first eight verses of chapter uh, 13. Saul's been king for two years. And we know by now as we read the book of 1 Samuel that these people from what is now Greece, these violent, sophisticated, skilled warriors called the Philistines have been a perennial threat to Israel. Uh, for several centuries, and they would continue to be a thorn in Israel's side all the way throughout David's, uh, King David's um, life and reign as well. Now Saul's son Jonathan has just won a victory at a town called Gibeah, which is very close to Jerusalem. 
And now the Philistines have done what, what aggressive armies in the ancient world do. They regroup. So they've gotten 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and they have it started to encamp about a quarter mile away from where Saul's forces are. And Saul's army is scared. And so they start to flee. Now, you're Saul, okay? He's a real human being. He's in a real situation. He has been hired to fight a battle just like this. They chose him to replace Samuel to go and fight his battles. And now the very thing that he needs to do what he was hired to do, namely an army, is leaving him. They're scared. They're frightened. He's bleeding soldiers. It's like being being a soldier in combat and bullets are falling out of your pocket as you're walking. That's not a good situation to be in. And so we come to verse 8 of chapter 13 where Saul decides to wait for seven days. Now these seven days were appointed by Samuel. Samuel said, you wait seven days and then I'm going to come to you at Gilgal and I'm going to offer the sacrifices. Now when you did that at wartime, that had a way of rallying the troops to say, look, the Lord your God is with you. Go into this battle, you're going to win. So, we know that from chapter 10, verse 8, that Samuel told him to wait. Now, for some reason, Samuel waited beyond the length of the seven days to come to help Saul. He said it would take, he said, wait seven days, then I'll come. Well, seven days pass, Saul's bleeding soldiers, and there's no Samuel. Okay? Now, we don't know whether Samuel did that on purpose so that Saul would fail. Remember, he, he, Saul has replaced Samuel, so there's probably a little bit of jealousy there himself. So, you're Saul, these, these, this Philistine army is an ear shot away, 30,000 chariots, you're bleeding soldiers, you don't know what to do. Now, you've got to make a decision here. And here is where Saul needed a devoted friend. Here's where Saul needed somebody who was devoted to the Lord and devoted to help him. Because here is what Saul decides to do. Saul says, bring to me the sacrifices. I'm going to do what Samuel used to do. And he offered up these sacrifices. Okay? Now what happens next is tragic in the fact that Samuel comes. He confessed. Saul confesses his wrongdoing. He says, I got nervous. I got afraid. You didn't come. And to me it sounds pretty honest. If you look in verses 10 to 12 of 1 Samuel 13, to me it sounds pretty honest, where he confesses his sin. He said, I didn't know what to do. Please forgive me. And so we hear Saul speaking in chapter 13, and it sounds like a young king who needed the help of a good friend at a very, very difficult time. Now what's shocking to me is that Samuel had an opportunity to be that friend. Samuel had an opportunity to show up on time and to tell Saul, I know you're afraid. I know you're afraid. This is a frightening situation. You're a young king. You've been put in a very, very difficult position. But whatever you do, don't transgress the word of the Lord. Samuel could have done that, but he didn't. He didn't. And this is what he says to him in verses 13 and 14. Samuel says to Saul, you've acted foolishly. You haven't kept the commandments of the Lord your God, which he commanded you to keep. God would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom's not going to stand. The Lord has sought a man after his own heart, a man who will do what the Lord commands him, and he's going to lead the people of Israel, and he's going to keep what the Lord has commanded him. So, I want us to think here for a second because that episode had the effect of crushing Saul. I mean, imagine if you heard that. You're a young king and you've just been told you have failed and you're going to be nothing but a failure. So, 
what we want to do is look back and say, what would a good friend have done? What would a devout friend have done to a man or a woman who's in a situation that is very difficult, very complex, there's ego involved, there's sin involved, of which it is not your fault, and yet you have to make a hard, life-changing decision. What would a good friend have done? I think a good friend would have ministered the Word of God to Saul in the specific situation that he's in. And this is the point I want to make, is that as Christians, we are certainly to be good friends of one another, but we are to especially be good friends of those who are in situations like Saul, to leaders who have to make hard decisions, to friends who are stuck in difficult, complicated binds. This is what good friends do. This is what a good friend, I think, would have done, would have reminded Saul of Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 18 to 20. And in short, what Moses said is, look, whenever a king comes on his throne, he needs to write for himself a copy of the law. He's got to have a Bible, and he needs to read it every day, make sure it's certified by the priests. It needs to be with him, and he needs to read it all the days of his life that he might learn to fear the Lord his God and to keep his commandments and his statutes in every situation that his heart might not be lifted up against his brothers and that he might not do what Saul did and turn aside to the left and to the right. That his kingdom might endure and that his sons might reign after him. So, again, friends, just to back up for a second, help you understand what we're trying to do. We're looking at King Saul. We're saying that his life took a tragic turn after this moment where he transgressed the word of the Lord. But he was in such a difficult situation. He needed a friend to say, okay, okay, I know this looks bad. I know you are tempted to cross this line, but don't. Don't. Look at this book. Look at this book. Read this book. These are the words of God. Forget Samuel for a minute. Forget what he, you think he should be doing or what he could be doing. Forget that. You hear the words of God. Now, friends, the point that we need to learn is that if you want to be a devoted friend, we got to develop some skill and facility with the Word of God to minister the right text in the right situation. And I think we all know that, okay, I represent the Lord, and that's good and that's helpful. But Saul didn't need somebody to represent the Lord. Samuel was doing that in a mmm kind of way. What Saul needed was a devoted friend to minister the exact text that he needed at the exact time. And that text was Deuteronomy 17, 18 to 20. Look, you've got your own copy, Saul, of this Word of God. Read it. Know it. Let's, let's walk through it together and see, look, okay... We ought not offer these sacrifices. God, God will intervene. He will come to our aid. But whatever you do, don't transgress and do what is only authorized for the priest to do. Now, friends, that's real life. That's real life. That's the kind of situations that you and I live in day to day. And so I think that the Lord's counsel here is helpful that we gain Bible knowledge and we gain Bible facility not just to become more educated and articulate, although that's important, but to help others, help friends in their hour of need. I mean, think, if a friend had been there with Saul, they might have re redirected the whole pattern of his, the whole trajectory of his kingdom and his career and even his life. So devoted friends help their friends do the words of God. They help, we help one another keep the commandment that we're tempted to transgress. And that's what Saul needed. Now the second thing that these devoted friends do is that they give wise counsel. Now we're going to flip over to chapter 15 and look at this second episode where Samuel needed somebody to give him wise counsel counsel. Devoted friends give wise counsel. So by now you can see that between Saul and Samuel uh, there's history. There's tension. 
One has replaced the other. One's much more experienced and skilled than the other. And one, ha namely Samuel, has made the other um, feel terrible. Now what's fascinating about this story is that even though Samuel said that the kingdom will be revoked, it hasn't happened in an official kind of way because we look at chapter 15 and the Lord's given Sam Saul another chance. He's given Saul another chance. Samuel comes to Saul sometime later and this is what he said. And you can almost see Samuel saying this begrudgingly as there's this unspoken tension between Saul and Samuel. He says, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Chapter 15 verse 1. And now hear the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what the Amalekites did to the people of Israel in that they opposed them when they came up out of Egypt. The Amalekites are people on the other side of the Jordan as Moses was leading them up around the nation of Israel on the eastern side of the Jordan and the Amalekites um, opposed them as they were on their way. And now he says, go and you kill the Amalekites, you strike them, and you wage a haram, you wage a holy war against, against that entire nation. You have no pity on them, and you kill every living thing, every man, every woman, every donkey, every infant, every, every living thing, every camel, everything, every ox, you kill everything. Now, here's the moment, here's the moment where I think a good friend could have entered in to, to Saul's ear and come to him at that exact moment as because the rest of the chapter will chronicle how Saul prepared for this war, conducted the war, but you can almost sense, can't you, Saul doing it in kind of a uh, begrudging kind of way, almost looking for a way to spite Samuel and to find a way to do what Samuel said, but not to let him know who's really in charge. That's what, he's, that's what Saul's tempted to do. Now here's where I think a good friend could have come in and given Saul some good counsel. And here's what I think that counsel would have sounded like. Saul, don't confuse the Lord with his servants. Saul, Saul, don't confuse the Lord God with Samuel. Yes, yes, the Lord God speaks with Samuel. Yes, Samuel is flawed. Yes, Samuel may have intentionally not come to your aid on purpose so that you would fail. Yes, he may have done that. And he was wrong, Saul. He was wrong. But don't confuse the words that come from Samuel's mouth with Samuel. His words are the Lord's words. And so you will obey his words, not because you like Samuel, but because you love the Lord your God. You separate the message from the minister. Now, how helpful is that? How helpful is that to hear? Because here's, here's what a good friend would have said. Saul, do not let a personal quarrel interfere with your personal piety. Don't let your riff, your beef, your, your antagonism with Samuel interfere with your devotion to the Lord. Because if you do that as king, it's going to be devastating. For better or for worse, Saul, you're in a position where there is zero room for error because your decisions affect the whole country. So don't make a devastating decision just because you're mad at Samuel. But you know what? Nobody told that to Saul. Nobody was there to get in his ear and say that. He had no friends that we know of. And so, that's not what happened. Saul didn't keep the Lord's command. He took some of the sheep for the people. He took the best of the livestock, and he didn't kill Agag, the king of the Amalekites, as the Lord had instructed. Now, did he do it to spite Samuel? We don't know. We can speculate that he did, but we don't know. Maybe, but he didn't keep the Lord's command. And so that takes us to verses 17 to 19 of chapter 15. And Samuel says, 
after, after Saul has failed to keep the Lord's command, Samuel says, I know that you're small in your own eyes, Saul. I know that you don't have a lot of self-esteem. But guess what? You've been raised up over the tribes of Israel. The Lord has anointed you to be king over Israel. And He sent you on a specific mission, along a specific path. He said to you, go and you wage a holy war and you avenge the Amalekites. You deal, you visit, with, you visit them for their sins and you fight them and you make a complete end of them. Now, why haven't you listened to the voice of the Lord? Now, maybe Samuel set him up to disobey. Maybe. We don't know that. We're just trying to learn from the story. But nonetheless, it was the Lord's words that Saul refused. He says, you pounced on the spoil, and now you've done evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I call Saul's life because let's look at what happened next, and it's so tragic. So tragic. Skip down to verses 24 to 26 of chapter 15 where Saul says to Samuel, I've sinned. I can see now that I've transgressed the word of the Lord. I've not done what he said. I've done... And he, and he even says why he did it. Look at this moment of honesty. He says, I feared the people and I listened to their voice. That's a confession. That's the very thing that the book of Deuteronomy says do when you sin. That's what the New Testament says do. It's a confession. Look, Samuel, I was wrong. I was wrong. And then he pleads for forgiveness. He says, take away my sin and then come with me and I'll worship with the Lord. That's a plea for forgiveness. But it's so sad that because Samuel didn't have any devoted friends, it's too late. Verse 26, Samuel said to Saul, I'm not going back with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Wow. So I, again, the point I want us to take away from that very tragic scene is that had Saul had good friends who would give him wise counsel, maybe, maybe the kingdom wouldn't have been ripped from his hand. We don't know. It's all in the Lord's providence. But, you know, sometimes as we're thinking about giving wise counsel, sometimes that's risky, isn't it? I mean, maybe, maybe you're in a relationship right now where the Lord's stirring you to get involved and be this kind of friend that the Word of God is calling you to be. And one of the reasons you may not want to do it is because it's so risky. I'm afraid I'm going to have to put some chips on the table. I'm afraid I might lose some standing and credibility with someone, with my friend, if I risk that. But had Saul had that, his life may never have taken the tragic turn that it did. Because from this point forward, friends, there's no going back. He's, gone, he's about to go off the cliff, and we're about to look at that, but he has gone off the cliff because he didn't have somebody to do for him what Proverbs chapter 27 verse 6 says that we ought to do for one another. Proverbs 26 says this, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. I mean, basically, when your friend comes to you and says something that hurts and they do it because they love you and they don't want to see you go off a cliff and that feels like a bruise in the kidney, the Word of God says that's reliable. That's helpful. That's going to save your life. Receive it. Now, we don't always know how someone's going to handle a punch in the kidney. We don't always know if they're going to fire back with one at the, in the teeth for us. But love risks that, is what I'm trying to say. Love risks that. And had anybody risked that for Saul, he may not have had, he may not have lived the catastrophic life that he does from this point forward. And so now, we turn to chapter 16. And here we're taking the rest of the book in one big picture, okay? So what we've essentially said is that Saul started out on a decent uh, reign. He was gifted. He was courageous. He was talented. He was put in a very difficult position. He was isolated, isolated in that position without any devoted and devout friends. And so 
his life took a tragic turn. He didn't have anybody to minister the word specifically to him, and he didn't have anybody to give him wise counsel. And then finally, he didn't have anybody to deal with the deep issues of his heart. That's what he needed most. He needed somebody to see his heart, to know his heart, and to get in there and deal with him on that level. He needed that more than he needed anything else. He needed a friend to confront the deep issues. So the rest of the book deals with Saul's intense jealousy over this young man named David. I've heard it said of David that he was the most versatile gifted man that the Lord ever used. And I think that's probably accurate. I mean, David was a phenomenal warrior, musician, poet, songwriter, administrator, warrior, general. I mean, just keep going. He was incredibly gifted and incredibly charismatic. Now, initially, Saul wasn't jealous of David. I mean, David helped, helped him, minister to him, would play his harp and would tend to his depression as Saul entered into depression. But then this happened. And this is probably the most important episode, I, or episode, maybe this is the most important passage in the rest of the book of 1 Samuel. And we're going to turn to chapter 18 and look at verses 6 to 9. 6 to 9, this will be the last part that we look at together, 6 to 9. So, Saul is on his way back from the episode that we know of as the battle between David and Goliath. So, a battle has taken place between the Israelites and the Philistines in a little strip of land in the Jezreel Valley called the Valley of Elah. So, this is after that episode. And Saul's heading back to Gilgal, likely, where his hometown was. And then, lo and behold, here come some women. And they come from all the cities as the king is going back to his palace. So it's a parade. And they're singing and they're dancing and they're coming out to greet Saul, the king. And so this is a victory parade. And they have tambourines and they're singing and they're dancing. And they've got these three-string instruments. And they are joyously saying to one another. And this line, this line was the undoing of Saul because he didn't have a devoted friend to help him deal with it. This one line. Saul has slayed his thousands. Wonderful. Amazing. But David, ten thousands. Saul, wonderful. Silver medal. David, the king we always wanted. That's what he heard. He heard, we've rejected... Not only has God rejected you, Saul, but the whole nation has rejected you. David's the one we want, not you. And so all he hears is failure, and if failure, danger. Because in that day, if you were going to lose the throne, you were going to lose your life. For the very same reason that Samuel has been a thorn in Saul's flesh. When you replace a king, the predecessor is now a threat. So what do you do? You take him out. And Saul says, if they're saying that about David, I'm on my way out and my life is almost over. And so he becomes insanely paranoid and insanely jealous over this young man, David. And so we read in verses 6 to 9, or verses 8 to 9, the scripture says this, that when Saul heard that, he became so angry, he became violently hot because what he heard was evil in his ears because they said that David, David has killed his ten thousands but only Saul his thousands. I'm second best. And he says, now I'm afraid because now they're going to give him the kingdom. And from that point forward, from that day forward, he went after David. And the rest of the book is about him chasing his son-in-law, a man who becomes his son-in-law, a devout friend to him, chasing him violently, aggressively, seeking to kill him because he's possessed by this jealousy. And here's where we'll end, friends. 
What did Saul need there? What did Saul need? He needed a devout friend who would have asked him two questions. Number one, Saul, why are you so jealous of David? He just, he just needed to say it. Saul, why are you so jealous of David? What has he done? Is David a threat to you? Has he done anything that would show you he's coming after you? Is there any reason for you to be afraid of his presence? Isn't he for you? Just because the women say that he has done more than you have, why does that necessarily mean he's going to take your life? Saul, your, your jealousy is running and ruining your life. Is it worth it? Saul, is this worth it? Is, is your jealousy worth what you are doing in killing the priests of God, in chasing this innocent man? He could have taken your life twice, Saul. You were using the restroom and he cut your garment. He says, look, I, want, I don't want to kill you, Saul. I'm not after you. Look, leave me alone. I'll serve you all my days. And David proved that when Saul died. But Saul refused to hear it. Or was it that he had nobody to tell him? He had nobody to ask that question. He had nobody to deal with him on that level. And had he, maybe this story would have taken a better end. And so, you know... It's not often that I think about that classmate of mine who passed away tragically 15 years ago, but I look back and I say, you know, somebody out there needs you to be that kind of friend to them. And to be in a church like Third Presbyterian, where we walk through the scriptures, you more so than anybody else are fit to be that friend. And so the Word of God would leave us, as we look at this man, Samuel, to say, be that friend. Min know the Word of God. Minister the Word of God specifically and caringly to people with whom the Lord has put you in relationship. Give them wise, seasoned counsel not to transgress the Word of the Lord. And, and deal with them on the heart level, on the gut level, on the deepest issues of their life. And you might save that life. You might save that life. And when you enter into the kingdom with you, they very well may thank you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we've had a tall task before us tonight to take the life of this man Saul in one view. And so I hope, Father, that the lesson has been clear that we might be around people like Saul right now and not know it. That you might have called us to reach out and to be the sort of friend that King Saul never had and to be the sort of friend that this young man that I knew growing up never had, a devout friend, a friend who knows the Lord and a friend who is devoted to this relationship. May we be such friends, Father, and may we steer lives into a holy and godly direction. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen.